So welcome once again. We'll be looking at uh, corporate governance. What does it mean? We've heard it over and over. We've practiced it in one way or the other. It permeates almost every aspect of uh, of corporate entities. Um, we know why. We know why because of risk management issues. So we'll be looking at corporate governance, and we'll also be trying to understand its tenets, its importance. Okay, how it could be deployed or applied in, 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 the, in the company setting, especially in the cases of listed entities, okay? And see how best we could leverage on the, on the principles of corporate governance to make the workplace a better place. Okay, so we, we take, as usual, a look or a deep dive into corporate governance. Okay, so at the end of the day, we want to see the risk associated with corporate governance the evolution, I will not spend too much time on the evolution of corporate governance code, how it has become a fundamental aspect of um, management of firms in the UK. Um, it's historical, but it's key for us to know. We look at the fundamental principles of corporate governance, the importance, the benefits of corporate governance, the changing roles and the differing roles between the board chair or, or chairman of the board and then the CEO, and then the responsibilities of these key committees, audit committee, nominations, and remunerations. And then we also look at the US um, rules-based approach to corporate governance, and then the UK principles-based approach to corporate governance. And then we we'll wrap up with some theories. Theories, again, of corporate governance, I'll leave it for you to, to, to find out, okay? I'll leave it for you to find out. Okay, so, um let's 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 go okay. all right corporate governance so simply talks about how we we govern the company okay let's put it that way so the the way in which we manage we run the company in the interest of shareholders and the interest of everyone else every other stakeholder okay usually applicable to listed companies, quoted entities, okay? Other firms, of course, also could adopt or leverage on the best practices of corporate governance. And of course, the reason why this has become predominant and prominent in corporate uh, management or in academic practice, in professional practice, why, we, why are we learning it? It's because of the failures that have characterized accounting, big accounting auditing firms, okay? We know the story of Enron and, and Wacom. Polypec International, you know, this guy came into UK very young age, started dealing in textiles, became a prominent person or figure in the textile industry, and only for him to start um, defrauding the system, okay, running his own things, okay. So he realized that everything happening here has to do with fraud. Fraud risk occurs if we have weak corporate governance systems. So this guy ended up incurring thefts or stealing shareholders' money, or, I mean, stakeholders' money to the tune of over $540 million when he was convicted and was about to be, uh, his name is Asil, Asil Nader, when he was about to be, he was convicted, actually sentenced, and then he, he managed to fly away from UK to, to Northern Cyprus and was aided by a pilot. I think the pilot was later convicted for, for aiding a fugitive. But he later came back in 2011, showed no remorse whatsoever, and was was captured and sentenced to 10 years. Okay, look at the Maxwell Communications Corporation's scandal, Barron's Bank. Okay, so I've intentionally given you the uh, um, a link to the Barron's Bank situation, where the main brain behind the collapse of this bank, which has survived for hundreds of years, one person's act collapsed the bank in the name of nick lazen i think he was at the age of 28 he was just going to jail it's sad recently we also saw the r is it the rsb the swiss bank where we have one person causing billions of pounds losses to the company and the guy was sentenced seven years and the guy is from my country ghana adoboli quick adoboli um, it's sad anyway so what you should know is that if we don't have strict, strong, stringent corporate governance systems in place, 
people people will run their way okay people will run their way through and sometimes you are even motivated by those at the top to misbehave but when things come up in the light you may bear the brand you will be the one in the limelight and you'll be seen as the criminal okay at the forefront so we we should be careful okay sometimes those at the top are smart they can they can use you as their toy to do their own thing okay so the public lack trust in the accounting profession and um, so because accountants auditors were taught to be ethically um, undertaking some unethical activities so a variety of measures were put in place to improve quality so accounting standards they narrow the choice of what you have to do and what you don't have to do professional bodies introduce professional codes of conduct to govern activities and then government intervention okay it is always key that the, that the board should communicate clearly with all stakeholders particularly the shareholders okay it is a key leadership expectation in all corporate governance activities now what is the importance okay the companies are required who are required to follow this corporate governance usually are those listed on the stock exchange you don't meet this you hardly be listed or you will hardly be qualified okay to to enroll on the stock market so the code the corporate governance code has been developed from the uk governance codes okay we follow more of a principles base whereas the us follow the the rules base we'll look at this uh, briefly later on corporate governance helps in reducing risk risk management okay so look at the failures of all these scenarios where why did these failures occur okay because amongst others they identified unified role of the ceo and chairman um decisions made in the personal interest of directors other than those of the shareholders people lacked expertise and knowledge okay those who run these activities lack expertise poor controls or controls were even strong but people bypassed them independence of auditors were questioned and there was lack of interest by the key investing institutions which caused the failures of this this is a chart okay it's the cadbury report cadbury committee report in 1992 issued the best practice okay the greenbury uh, committee report in 1995 made recommendations on the director's remuneration what should be disclosed so you can see almost all companies now in their listings is or listed companies in their financial statement report you see a separate report on director's remuneration it has to be disclosed okay hampel's committee also cemented the cadbury report of 1992 with the best practice and this led to what we call the principles of good governance and the code of best practice okay now if we okay now if we proceed you realize that the 10 bull committee report very important we'll look at this more which instituted or which recommended internal controls and risk management to be instituted in the workplace okay and then we also had the Higgs report of 2003, which introduced or brought in the idea of or, or the, the stringent regulations on non executive directors. Then again, supported by Smith's report on audit committees, okay, and all of these led to what we have today as the code. Uh, it used to be called Combined Code on Corp Corporate Governance, but now we simply call it the UK Governance Co UK Corporate Governance Code of 2018, most likely. It to be revised because you realize that it has been revised over the period over the past okay from 92 to now so the latest revision taking place in 2018 okay i'll post a document online where you see the evolution and the functions of these various committees and how it it it, it got to the final conclusion or current situation or stage of the 2018 corporate governance code what is the importance what are the limits what are the dimensions? So the dimensions, we're looking at the rules base and the principles base, okay? But again, um, the importance is that it leads to greater fairness and openness of the directors. Public tends to have confidence in the companies, okay? And of course, risk reduction for both investors and other stakeholders is very key. It leads to at least some, some mitigation of risk, okay? Lower risk of strong CEO domination. CEO cannot always lord over all of us, okay? And then there could be transparency 
clear communication of information to all those who are concerned, and it improves performance and leadership by the board, the oversight committee, the oversight boards, okay? The limitation is that corporate governance does not prevent corporate failures and collapse. Some of these companies which have collapsed have very strong corporate governance systems. Again, it cannot prevent companies from failing to achieve the objectives, okay? So people have, it's, it's like knowing and doing. People have all of this in place, but as to whether they actually practice it is a question, okay? The UK's um, principles base simply deals with comply or explain why you think you cannot comply, okay? So the code has no force in law. It is enforced only on listed companies through the stock exchange, okay? You are expected to comply with these codes or you explain why you think you may not be able to comply in some areas. Give good reasons. And it's a trademark of corporate governance in the UK. So quoted companies will have to state that they have complied with all the code or else, like I said, explain to shareholders and other stakeholders why you think you cannot. It allows some flexibility. Okay, it allows for some flexibility and non-compliance might be acceptable in some situations. Maybe I don't have an audit committee. Why? Maybe there could be some good reasons. You are not getting people who would be willing to serve as um, independent non-executive directors. Okay. For the SOX, the U.S. Sovereign Oxley Act okay, of 2002, it has to do with enforcement and documentation. There's nothing like comply or explain. So high-profile companies have collapsed in the U.S. What come? And wrong and this motivated the SOX, okay SOX act so it's detailed it differs from our uk code on two points it is rules based rather than principles and it demands that we have detailed documentation for internal controls and their audits okay the main points normally are seven have a compulsory audit committee for all listed companies restrain the external auditors so that they cannot be auditing or also be providing auxiliary services. You prepare the accounts and you audit. I remember when I was with KPMG, um, I had to escalate it because we have our advisory seven preparing the payroll and accounts for a client. And then I was in the audit and we go and audit this same guy. It's like auditing your brother's work. There's no way you can qualify, okay? There's no way. You have to give them a clean sheet. So... Auditors cannot be doing these advisory services for a client and still auditing it. No. Senior audit partners must rotate every five years, and this is highly, I think this is adopted almost globally. Directors should be pro prohibited from trading in shares at certain sensitive times so that they don't take advantage of the system. More detailed disclosures for any off-balance sheet financing, you have to disclose it. Okay. And the annual reports should have statements on internal controls, okay, risk management as well. And of course, the financial statements, for it to be considered reliable and accurate, the CFO or the CEO must sign off or certify them that is it's correct. So it is, it is a known fact that the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development advocates for these good corporate governance principles. Okay, And what they normally advocate are rights of shareholders. One share equals to one vote for all shareholders. Okay, so all shareholders should have some form of acknowledgeable rights, if not equal, equitable. Okay, there should be equitable treatment of shareholders, like I'm saying, those with minority interests should be treated fairly. Equitable treatment of all other stakeholders, apart from the shareholders, then there should be accurate and timely information provided to, to those who use the financial report and financial statements or corporate reports, annual reports of the companies. Now, the UK code, so we're now narrowing down our UK code, which may not be too different from the, the US code, okay? Any of them, it's not too too different. Now, the UK code covers five key areas per the principles. So leadership, effectiveness, accountability, remuneration, relations, and uh, with, with shareholders, okay? Now, the best practice recommends four items that, which, let's look at the membership of the board, okay? How direct tax remuneration is decided and disclosed okay the role of internal and external auditor and then audit committees how the public could have right to know how the company is governed through your disclosures okay now the code covers so like i've said these five areas we're going to be looking at it leadership is one of them and here we're looking at 
two key items there, the board chairman and the CEO. Do they have overlapping roles? They cannot be the same. Okay, there should be different guys. So the board chairman and CEO, the CEO runs the company, the board chair runs the board. They should be separate individuals. No, none of them should have too much power. Again, there should be some great distinction between the executive directors and the non-independent, non-executive directors. Ideally, if the board could be structured such that we have 50 executive directors, 50% being executive directors and 50% being independent nerds, that would be great. Now, the rules, the non-executive directors' rules, generally, they set the strategy, okay? They have the right and responsibilities to, to contribute to strategic directions, challenging strategy, offering constructive advice on what to do. They also scrutinize roles of colleagues, okay? Um of executive directors most especially to ensure that optimum um, effectiveness is achieved and then the role of risk they also have adequate control to ensure that we have strong internal control system and risk management systems in place and what about people role appointing demoting sacking setting the executive uh, the remuneration of the executives and senior officials and also Disciplining them where and, where, where and when necessary is key for the non-executive directors. That's why they are supposed to be independent to be able to crack the whip where necessary. The CEO, the board chairman, and the executive director. So CEO and chairman must be different, as we've said. CEO cannot go on to become the chairman of the same, like I said, he cannot be the same person. Chairman should be independent on appointment. It is required that the Financial Times Stock Exchange 100, that a full-time executive director cannot also take on more than one or, um, role okay, for the FTSE 100. And a full-time executive director cannot also be the chairman of an FTSE 100 company, okay, Financial Times Stock Exchange. And a, a significant portion of executive director's pay should be performance-related. Perform well. You get a good bonus, okay? Now, the nets, the non-executive directors, the independents, they should be independent. That's the key word. So, appoint one NED as a senior independent director. Okay, a director may not be independent if this person was has been an employee within the last five years, has significant shareholding in the company, has some family life ties with the company, maybe a wife, a child, a relative, um, works in a senior role or even in the company, um, it should be scrutinized. And again, if they receive other benefits in addition to their director's fee, their independence could be compromised. They should not have had any material business relationship with the company, okay, within the last three years, and they shouldn't have served on the board for more than nine years. It is ideal that nerds who serve longer than six years should be subjected to rigorous review rigorous review now these are the changing roles or the diverse roles of the ceo and then the board chairman the board chairman runs the board sets out the vision for the company provides leadership for the board and looks at the composition of board decides plans the agenda for the board meetings chairs all the board meetings and encourages nerds to present their ideas to the board chairs annual general meetings and other meetings with shareholders and also presents the shareholders opinion on the boards okay and they serve as the, the bridge, the liaison between the shareholders and the directors. And also they arrange communication of AGMs, of shareholders, with the remunerations committee, audit committee, nominations committee. For the CEO, he runs the company. He's like the face of the company to the, share, to the shareholders and to the stakeholders. And he also serves as the link, the liaison, the bridge between the employees and the board. Okay, so take everything to him. And who escalated to the board? He implements the strategy which has been set by the board, is held accountable for all company operations, and he normally tries to make sure the team is coordinated, is, is together, working together. He also arranges and manages resources for company operations, monitors budgets and operations to ensure they are not deviating, or even if they are deviating uh, within reasonable. Um, variances and help select board members as well. Okay, what about the specific roles and responsibilities of the nurse? We've, we've mentioned some already that they help to appoint, they have 
the power to hire and to fire. And they could decide <clears throat> on the remuneration of the executive directors. They provide independent criticisms of the decisions of the executive directors, and they review the management performance, senior management performance, whether they are working or they are performing in line or not. They sometimes help in reviews, like performance appraisal, okay? And they assist in development of strategy and evaluate the financial and, and control systems of the company. Internal controls, risk management, and sureties are in place. Now, for their specific responsibilities, they should foster trust with the executive directors. They should know everything about the company and the industry in which they operate. They should also keep themselves abreast with changes going on in the company and in the industry and ensure that there's accurate, timely, sufficient information before all meetings. Okay, of course, sometimes there could be emergency, but that should be some one-offs, okay? And they should also prom promote some high ethical and governance standards within. So like we've said, their independence is very key, okay? There should be as many nets as executive directors so that they could oversee the shareholders' interests, okay? When hiring a NED, ensure that they have enough experience, industry experience and very independent, okay? The greater experience they have, the better. If they are not, then, you know, they, they may be compromised, okay? And then it's, it's effective, it's important that you get nets that cuts across a broad range of experience or fields of expertise. Why is their independence important? Objectivity in company decisions. They bring in a variety of knowledge in decision making and they give the shareholders a voice. Okay, they give the shareholders a voice in the board and they tend to reduce any risk that could arise from the personal interest of the executive directors. So it's important. There will be there will be a threat, like we said, there could be a threat to their independence if this person is a shareholder, has family ties, has some additional compensation or business dealings, has been an employee over the past five years or been on the board for more than nine years or is a director of another company that may have some relationship with this company. Now, board effectiveness and accountability. The board works effectively most likely when there's a variety of skills experienced amongst these board members, okay? When there is a formal appointment procedures, you don't just handpick someone, but it goes through a rigorous selection process. When these board directors dedicate so much time to company matters, and they are given full induction upon orientation upon appointments, okay, and they always keep their knowledge abreast, updated with changing trends. Of course, these directors, when they stand for re-election annually, it makes them effective. So I have to work hard so that I will be selected or nominated the next time. Accountability, they present the company status and future reports. Okay, they should present it. They should also decide on the strategy on how to achieve the objectives. Um, should we take the risk? Should we avoid the risk? Should we transfer the risk? Okay, they, they set the risk. Sometimes they set the risk appetite for the company. Okay, they are responsible for implementing stringent and strong internal control and risk management systems, and they must annually, periodically review the internal control systems. We have the audit committee that monitors the independence of the external auditors. Sometimes they also work with the internal auditors to ensure their independence. So their aim or their roles typically is to look at the integrity of the financial statements, okay, to review the internal controls and risk management systems, and also look at the effectiveness of the internal audit function and the independence of the internal audit functions. What they also do is that they normally make the appointments regarding the appointment, the reappointment, the removal of the external auditor. And they also approve the remuneration in terms of engagement of any audit, um, audit contract or audit engagement exercise. Of course, they look at the independence, the objectivity, the integrity, the effectiveness of the external auditors and the entire audit process. So these guys should have enough experience to undertake these activities, okay? If there are any non-audit services by the external auditor, they will develop and they will approve or disapprove, okay? Now, the UK Corporate Governance Code allows that they should be 100% non-executive directors, okay? The FTSC 350 requires that committee should have at least three. 
but for smaller listed companies, they could have at least two. At least one member should have recent and relevant financial experience. Very key, okay, to guide directions. Nominations. So like the name sounds, they are the ones who nominate, okay? They are charged with ensuring that the board has the appropriate skill, expertise, knowledge, and experience, okay? Periodically, what do they do or what are their roles every now and then, okay? They look at the structure, composition, and balance of the board, ensuring that executive directors and non-executive directors are balanced, their numbers on the board are balanced. They should also ensure appropriate management of diversity to board composition, okay? If there is any dominance um, in terms of powers by the CEO or chairman, they come in, they come in to, to, to smoothen this out, okay? They give, they look at succession planning so that one director leaves, the next person can take over. And they are also always interested in ensuring we have a detailed job description on the roles and responsibilities of the board chairman or any senior um, official, okay? And they also identify and nominate board candidates to fill a board. So sometimes they have to identify someone and pick the person and recommend, okay? But of course, this person goes through some rigorous review. And they also make recommendations regarding the standing for reappointment of directors. And the Corporate Governance Code for UK expects that 50% of the nominating committee members should be nerds, independent nerds. Remuneration, like the name sounds, they look at the entire nomination, the, the, the entire remuneration for the executives, okay, um, to ensure that the executive directors do not set their own pay. What do they do? So they set the, the, the salary, the pensions, the benefits in kind, okay, in cash, the bonuses, performance related, any of them for the executive directors and the chairman, okay. And then they also look at same thing for senior management. What is highlighted here is that the remunerations for these big guys should be high enough to motivate them and to compensate them for their efforts. Note carefully that the remuneration of the non-executive directors is normally set by the board or where permitted by a separate committee. Okay, Like I said, most of the performance most of the salary or remuneration of these big guys, the executive directors, should be linked to performance, okay, performance related to ensure the long-term success of the of the company, okay, so that people don't just play around, okay. Remuneration of nerds should not be performance related, else to compromise their independence. Now, the UK gov corporate governance code requires that the remuneration committee should be 100% independent nerds. FTSE 350 committee should have at least three members, it's recommendation, but smaller ones could have at least two members being nerds, okay, on the remuneration. Again, it is also advocated that there should be share options for directors. When the director is allocated some share options, he will work hard to ensure that the share value increases, okay? That's why some of the theories come in, still worship, theories, um, agency theory. So if you see yourself as an agent, you are working as an agent for commission. But if you see yourself as a principal, of course, you work to promote the long-term, not the short-term interest of the company, okay? So uh, other factors could also influence the share price, okay? Um, these other factors could be the overall business environment in which the company operates um, the fashion trend of the time. But share options should be aligned share options should be aligned to the director's personal goals with company success. It also ties them down so that they identify with the company and it gives them an incentive to make sure the company performs well. Okay, now the governance and internal controls, very important to wrap up everything. So the board responsible, board, board's responsibility, they are responsible to ensure that we have a sound internal control system. It's not just for it to be sound and, and, and just in place, but we should also ensure that as a board, we should also ensure that they review the effectiveness of these internal controls. Are they implemented? Are there some loopholes and gaps? Let's seal them. And these, the, the board, again, reports to the shareholders that this review has been carried out, so they are in safe hands. If you look at the development of corporate governance, the 10 goal reports is very key, and it still stands, still, it still holds high. 
Now, the Tembo report requires that internal controls should be established using a risk-based approach, okay? Not, not any, any materials. I mean, materiality could be important, but the risk base is very important, okay? Sometimes they, they work hand in hand, okay? So specifically, the company in, 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 in question should establish its business objectives, identify risk associated with the company, decide on controls to mitigate these risks, to block off these risks, set up effective, strong, and implement such strong internal control systems with regular feedback to see where we have to revise, where we have to amend, and also review the internal controls under the five headings by the COSO. You remember the Treasury Commission's report on that one. So finally, I want you to do this agency theory very easy. We know what it stands for, the, the agent principal scenario. Stakeholder theory, we have to work to satisfy all stakeholders. This is a very broad theory. As of now, we wouldn't want to go into the ethical and normative um, dimension, but just just stakeholder theory on the surface, okay? Stewardship theory has some link with the agency. Okay, look at the resource dependency theory, transaction cost theory, and political theory. Political theory, you don't have to go deep and look at the classical and the badges, forget it, just, just the political theory. Okay, that's it. So that is what we have for the corporate governance. Again, like I said, we have some questions online. We have some questions that we have posted online for the tutorial. Look at it. Um, especially for the Barron's Bank, there are some corporate governance dimensions and ethical dimensions. And let's see how best we can discuss this during our Monday's class. So hopefully we should have another fruitful discussion. I'll post that one or two more recommended readings, articles, not too long articles, just some eight page, six page, and then um, keep yourself abreast with the topic on hand. Great. See you. Take care.